Our guest this week on Veterans Chronicles is Jason Pock. He's a veteran of the United States Army, 2nd Infantry Division. He also served this nation in uniform in Afghanistan. And Jason, thanks very much for being with us. Thank you for having me. You were born into a military family. In fact, you were born overseas as a result of your father's service, mm -hmm. correct? That is, that is correct. I am a military brat. Uh, I was born on post uh, in Yongsan in, in uh, one to one uh, military hospital there uh, where my dad was stationed. Um, I was born in February 13, 1989. Uh, my dad had an extended uh, period of service while he was in the Army in Korea. Um, he stayed there for about eight to nine years. Um, and uh, we lived in Korea for a while and then we relocated. Uh, I mean, we moved around a lot. I've lived in a lot of different countries, including Korea, Japan, uh, and then in the state side, I lived in California, Kansas, when my dad was in language school. Um, so I've lived a lot of different places. Does your family have any connection all the way back to the Korean War? Um, I don't believe so. Nothing on record. Uh, but my grandfather, uh, my, my dad's side, um, was that was around that time. And he, he tells us a lot of stories about, about that and all the hardships that they went through. And my dad is well, was a... Uh, immigrant when he when he immigrated to the United States when he was 10 years old. Um, so they had the opportunity to, to go to New York, uh, Highland Falls to be exact, where the, at the gates of West Point. Um, and then my, an, my dad ended up getting a commission, uh, not a commission, but a, an appointment to the academy and went through West Point. So. Fantastic. And as we'll learn in just a moment, uh, yeah. it's a family tradition. It is. So uh, you ultimately ended up attending high school right here in the Washington, D.C. area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As a result of your father's service, did you always have an interest in eventually either going to West Point or joining the Army? You know, absolutely. Um, and when I, at the time when I was making the decision on what I wanted to do uh, in terms of picking uh, a career path, uh, being a military back, being always surrounded by uh, kind of what my dad did, the relationships and bonds that he's formed while he was in the military. I kind of saw that and I, I envied that and I was like, maybe one day I want to be like that. And as I grew older and older, uh, I realized how close his relationships were with his soldiers and uh, with his uh, uh, um, with his unit, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, I saw that and I wanted that opportunity as well. So, uh, you know, my mom was a little bit reluctant and my, my dad was too at the time when I had told them that I did receive an appointment to the academy and I'd like to go to the academy. That's kind of what I want to pursue uh, just because of the conflicts that we were involved in. This was uh, post 9-11 um, and uh, obviously worries them as parents and I definitely understood that. Um, but the opportunities that, uh, that were presented to me at the time um, uh, in regards to service and being able to do something you know, per se, greater, uh, something for the greater good, something that'll make me better. Uh, I always thought, you know, going that route was going to help me out and establish a good foundation of uh, what I wanted to do in, later on in the future, even after the military. So I think it, it did that, did just that. I love that about the folks we talked to. Thank you so much for, the, yeah. for that approach to just how you uh, no feel problem. about America and, and what you can contribute to America. Um, you're also a fantastic athlete in high school, and you took that to West Point too, correct? I did. I was actually recruited to play soccer, so I played for the Army soccer team. Uh, so we traveled around, played a lot of Ivy League uh, schools, and uh, the demand uh, was, was pretty great in trying to balance academics and uh, physical as well as the military um, aspect of, of the school. But um, I pulled through and I graduated. So, um, you know, I, I, to this day, I, I love watching sports. I'm, I'm an avid sports fan of, of all the DC teams and stuff. So, um, so yeah, I've always remained active and I, I still stay active today too. Um, you know, we'll probably go into this later, but I've, uh, ever since I've, my injury, I've, I've done a couple marathons. I've done the Boston Marathon, New York City. Wow. I've done a Detroit Marathon in hand cycling. Um, and I've started running uh, on, on, on blades too, so we can talk about that a little bit later. But Fantastic. Yeah. Really interesting. What would you say, looking back, was the most important thing you learned while you were at the academy? Um, I think the most important thing I learned at the academy was time management and being able to prioritize and the importance of relationships, truly. Um, uh, when, it, when it comes to, I think, being an effective leader, being a well-respected leader, being uh, someone that people truly look up to and want to uh, listen to and, and uh, seek guidance from are people that that are, you know, uh, let me backtrack a little bit. Um, it's just, it, it really boils down to the very basic concept of being a good person uh, in terms 
me and my, my, my soldiers and my fellow friends, we always joke about it and say, you always have to be a good dude uh, in order to be effective anywhere. And that carried me through ranger school, through all the military schools that I've been to, even to Afghanistan. Um, if you're a good guy and guys respect you, um, they'll follow you, you know, wherever you lead them pretty much. And so I, that's what I, I learned at West Point from probably day one, you know, um, when you're within a group of, of individuals and you meet them for the first time, you know, the first impression um, to your, how well, you know, you can do your physical activities or military skills. Uh, but really it boils down to not being a perfectionist or being good at everything. Like I said, it really comes down to uh, how good of a person you are and if you are willing to lend that, that, that hand uh, to help others and to get to know them on a personal level and um, that's what I kind of learned from West Point. After graduation you went to both Airborne and Ranger School. Were those mm -hmm. areas you were always interested in, just wanted to check out? What was your decision on those two? Um, absolutely, like when you're a cadet at West Point and, and you know, you know the, arm, the Army is different from West Point in a way where West Point is its own culture. It, it's, it, it develops leaders to be in the army after after you commission so when you're at west point you're not technically really in the army i'd say i'd say they have their own ways of doing because they emulate the army as best as they can and it's it's a great institution so um uh i'm sorry can you ask that question again i i, was, I lost the one. decision to go to right. airborne and ranger school was that sure. your decision uh it was uh because while it was at west point among all the cadets you know going to like ranger school is kind of the you know, hey, you should go to Ranger School because not, it's not offered to everybody. It's only offered to a select uh, group of uh, cadets that choose the infantry branch. I myself was not an infantryman by trade. Uh, upon graduation, I was commissioned as a second lieutenant in field artillery in the field artillery branch. Um, so I actually had to compete for my slot to go into Ranger School. Um, when you have a Ranger tab, when you go through um, a school like Ranger School, you kind of, you come out with a tab, you're not in Ranger Battalion, which is a specialized unit with the Army, but you, you have the mark of going through a uh, tough a school as Ranger School. And, and uh, in a way, it's a uh, first impression uh, type deal that, you know, when you're in front of your soldiers, you know, it kind of shows you that, hey, you've been to something difficult and you, you, you know, and uh, kind of, I don't not, I wouldn't really say it tells, tells them who you are, but it, it shows that you've been through something tough and, and you've been through uh, tremendous adversity and you can pull out from it. So, um, you know, that's kind of why I seeked out Ranger School. Airborne School, I've, I've always had an affinity for jumping out of planes, so I thought that was always cool. Um, in Airborne School in particular, we, we did a couple of night jumps as well, which I thought was, was, uh, was um, exhilarating. It's kind of like jumping into a black hole, you know, you don't know what's out there, you can't really see what you're jumping into, but you know, I had a good time at Airborne School and uh, you know, I wasn't actually assigned to an airborne unit at the time, but that's kind of what I wanted to do later on, maybe after my first deployment. But, you know, so that's kind of why I went to Airborne Ranger School. Gotcha. And so then you were commissioned, in, or and you were already commissioned upon graduation, but then you were assigned to the to be a battalion fire support officer, correct? That's, yes. So um, I actually uh, was assigned to be an assistant battalion fire support officer to the, the battalion fire support officer. So um, when I first grad, so I immediately upon graduation from Ranger School, um, I reported to my first unit, which is in Fort Lewis, Washington, uh, right south of Seattle. Um, and my boss at the time was the battalion fire support officer, Captain Kraft, and he had told me, hey, you know, we're, we're suiting up for deployment. Uh, we're getting ready to go to the National Training Center in Fort Irwin, California, which is a, was pretty much preparation for deployment. Um, and so I rushed my way up there and, and that uh, was, was my official uh, duty, was, was kind of his, his right-hand man and, and coordinating and managing all the fire support officers with, that are down to the company levels and all the soldiers that are assigned to the fire support element within an infantry battalion. So that's kind of what, what my duty was. What did that mean in terms of how close you were to the action? Uh, so at the battalion level, you're going to be headquartered with battalion. Uh, so uh, generally, where, where we were at, we were co-located with. But so before I deployed to Afghanistan, I deployed to southern Afghanistan, uh, Panjway to be exact, which is the birthplace of Mullah Omar, who's the uh, Taliban. Uh, Taliban who founded it. Um, and uh, uh, so when I was... Sh 
shot down to the company level to be a company fire support officer. We were co-located with battalion, which was at a FOB. Our FOB was called FOB Zangabad. Um, uh, and we were right, right in the thick of it. We were right in the middle of it. Um, uh, you know, I remember my first uh, couple weeks there, um, we had a incident where our uh, ammo control point exploded and we had thought we were being rocketed. And that was kind of my first uh, taste of what it's like to be overseas. You know, I didn't expect much, you know, even going back to when I graduated Ranger School, I didn't know that the unit that I was assigned to was scheduled to deploy. Um, I wasn't one of those guys that looked at all the units, you know, deployment charts and when they're going to be in rotation to go down range. But, um, yeah, I, I had no idea. And I really didn't know what to say. I wasn't really scared. You know, I felt like I was, you know, I was pretty much training for, you know, five years prior to that for a deployment, right? And then that's kind of what we all want to do. And having that experience of being in combat is, is what all guys even at West Point, being a cadet, what they strive for is to be able to uh, be in action and, and, and to serve their country, right? So, um, but like I said, my battalion, our battalion headquarters was, was in the thick of it. A lot of the surrounding villages within our area of operations were right there that were heavily influenced by the Taliban just because of the region that we were in in Panjway. Um, uh, there's a book out called Lines of Kandahar, and that's the exact region. The, the Horn of Panjwa is what they called it, uh, was where our battalion was located. And so, um, yeah, we're relatively close, I would say. <laughs> yeah. Very much so. Um, just to finally set the stage, we'll get to the day that changed your life right sure. after the break. Um, much interaction with the Afghan people? Uh, yes, uh, pretty much on a daily basis. Um, um, the re where I was at, you know, we would conduct reconnaissance patrols is what we called it. We always went out and on foot uh, because we were a striker brigade, uh, meaning we uh, had uh, strikers uh, to our disposal and, and we used them, but we didn't use them that often just because of the, uh, the environment and the limited amount of roads. We only had one main road that, were that went through our whole area and the rest of it was all paths that, that the locals would walk and we would walk as well. So. Almost, I would say, uh, 60 or 70 percent of the time, we would head off to patrol on foot. Um, and every time we were on patrol, uh, we would always, you know, see kids always running out asking for candy, or, or they're in, infatuated by pens. Uh, they, it, it's it, because they're such a poor country, they're a war-torn country, and and where we were at was pretty much in the middle of nowhere. Almost, uh, we were about, I'd say, about an hour away from Kandahar, uh, but. Um, that's the closest big city in terms of Afghanistan. But, um, I mean, they, these people didn't have access to electricity, um, very limited water. Um, it was just, uh, it was, and to see, like, how infatuated these kids were with pens, they would just uh, ask Mr. Mr. Pen, and they would write something on their hand with their fingers as if to ask for a pen. And the minute we give them one pen, all the kids flock and want to, grab that pen that we gave to that other kid and he ends up getting beat up or something but you know and and, and candy they they love m&ms they love Kit Kats, snickers all that stuff that we can get our hands on and we try to so almost every time i made a made an effort to carry a little bit more pens or whatever to you know to hand it out and stuff but um my area was was pretty difficult in terms of engaging with the locals a lot because um not too long before about a year it's, i think it's been a year when i was there uh, where we had uh, a, a U.S. service member. Uh, it was all over the news. Um, Staff Sergeant Bales, mm -hmm. uh, he had left his uh, FOB or COP, his base, whichever, I think he was at a COP, and he had left and murdered, um, I think, like 20 or so uh, Afghan civilians, women and children lit fire on their, their houses. And so that was my AO. That was our, that was our area of operations. So we had a and he, all, he, wore the, he wore the same patch. He deployed out of Fort Lewis. He had the second ID patch. So that always, that left a mark, uh, especially in our area. And, and it, it kind of, something like that, when that happens, it, it immediately, um, it immediately kills a trust that has been built up since then. So started from the ground up, I think. And when we came in, there was still a little bit of, hes they were a little bit hesitant, right? Um, but in regards to finding IDs or uh, pointing out Taliban or uh, people that you know meant harm to their village, uh, they would be open about, and we'd 
get good intel um, just because they have kids around there. They don't want them out playing where there's an ID or an ID belt or a known ID that's been planted. So they were, uh, they were relatively good about, I think, uh, letting us know uh, and keeping us informed as much as they can. But um, I think it, it was hard to uh, um, kind of, w I think what, what it seemed like to them, well, most of the locals, we tried to go out there and we had our Terps with us all the time, our interpreters. And um, a lot of times we would try to uh, communicate to these people that we're here to help and we're not here to impose, impose anything else but help. Like we want to uh, make your way of life better. We want to kick out the bad guys. We, you know, and, and to some, to most locals, I think it was, you know, hey, it, you know, the Taliban come in and we, they kind of brainwash them. You know, they, they coerce them into doing things. Uh, whether it be through threats of their family or with money that they don't have, they offer up money and, and they'll get young kids to do stuff that that uh, that will hurt coalition forces. And uh, it was a very unfortunate thing to see a lot of times. Um, but I think majority, and, and we work pretty closely with the ANA, the Afghan National Army, and, and the local police. Um, we help train them up on our weapon systems and make them as sufficient as possible in order for them to take lead. Um, when I was there, they weren't on, in the lead. We tried to incorporate them into our patrols as much as possible. Uh, it, was, uh, it was pretty strict guidance that we had to have uh, an Afghan national, whether it be an ANA or, or police, embedded within our patrol um, when we went out. Um, so kind of teaching them the way and how we, we did things so that they could do it. From what I understand today, they are in the lead obviously, and uh, they um, are doing things where we are not in bed with them and they're doing things on their own. So, Jason, let's take a quick break. We'll be sure. right back on Veterans Chronicles. Welcome back to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Karemis, honored to be joined today by Jason Pock, retired U.S. Army Captain from the 2nd Infantry Division. And as we referenced briefly uh, in, in the previous segment, Jason, we're going to get to the day uh, that changed your life. It was December 12th, 2012. Mm -hmm. Explain what your duties were that day and, and what happened. Sure. Um, that day was, uh, it started out unlike any other day. Um, you know, I was a fire support officer for a uh, company fire support officer to be exact. Um, and uh, it was a routine patrol. Um, now, at the time that I was injured, uh, you know, I forgot to mention this, but when we had deployed, uh, I was actually in charge of four FOs, fire, fire observer, or f forward observers, I'm sorry, that were directly reported to me um, and were assigned down to the platoon. So within an infantry company, there's four platoons, and then um, uh, an FO was assigned to each platoon. Um, and uh, a platoon leader would usually be a lieutenant, which was the rank that I was um, at the time. and prior to de deployment, prior to when we shipped out, one of my FOs uh, realized he, uh, he had a really bad headache and went to the emergency room uh, and it was known that he had a brain cyst. So he had to go into emergency surgery and I had to go, this was the night before we were going to get on a plane and go to Afghanistan. So uh, we deployed without an FO. Um, and so myself and my um, NCO, uh, covered down for that platoon every time they were out on patrol. So uh, as a company fire support officer, I direc directly reported to the company commander. Um, and, uh, you know, at times the company commander uh, participated in patrols. Um, and like I said, the platoons rotate in and out of, of duties within uh, our responsibility, right? Whether it be one day they're on patrol, one they're on guard duty, one day they're out uh, at, a, at a CP, which is control point. Uh, and they do a rotation. Um, so almost every time uh, one of our platoons within our company went out on patrol, I was pretty much going out. Uh, at that rate, I was going out maybe, you know, three or four times a week. Um, and um, that particular day, like I said, was unlike any other. And we were actually tasked out to escort an engineer unit who were doing humanitarian, they were building roads, humanitarian aid. Um, they were, uh, you know, they wanted some support from the infantry guys just in case something bad had, would, would go down. Uh, and we didn't hesitate and we, we, we helped them out. And uh, 
we actually where they were going to looking at the con op the concept of operations they were going nearby a village that we had not been into yet um, we had not done a reconnaissance patrol and it was known uh, from the prior unit that we actually replaced that, that village was had some had a lot of suspicious activity in it and they have confirmed that Taliban have been operating uh, within there uh, there was a um, there was I think it was a I'm not sure if it was a church, but it was there was a building that they knew always had something going on, whether it be a uh, whether they would make IEDs there or something. But you know, it was in the works that we were monitoring that and seeing the activity there, and we had not done a patrol there yet. So, but they were operating very close by to there. These engineers, so we had um, escorted them, set up in our uh, support by fire positions, and uh, it was pretty much a pretty you know relaxed uh, kind of deal just in case something happened we're on guard and everything but nothing where we had our strikers with us as well because the engineers had their vehicles too um, and then I, I was on the radio as a fire supporter I'm monitoring multiple radios multiple frequencies to see what's going on and what battalion uh, our higher echelon is is doing and if they're tracking any kind of insurgent activity nearby so I always had to do that and battalion uh, had gone on the net and told uh, had relayed that there was uh, insurgent activity nearby from our location, I think roughly about maybe six, seven hundred meters away, uh, not not too far away, and that they had they had given the green light for an airstrike to occur. And so um, I'd relayed that to the platoon leader and to all of our guys. And, you know, at that moment in time, we're, like I said, we were just in our support by fire positions, just kind of um, hanging out and... Uh, actually something was happening so we were, we were pretty excited and like oh we're about to see a gun run and uh, that happened uh, gave the thumbs up to the helicopter pilots who do that a lot because uh, they uh, we're pretty much always supported by uh, rotary wing aircraft or um, um, and um, af right after that happened um, it's actually um, we had to do what's called a battle damage assessment uh, meaning Every time we conduct an airstrike of some sort or we are involved in any kind of tick or troops in contact uh, and it, it finishes out, we do a battle damage assessment where we cordon off the area, we go see the damage and see who's been killed or who's been injured and um, make sure the locals don't go out. And, and a lot of times what they would do is they would go out and grab what's left of wh whatever body part and they put in their little thingies and run off and to prevent that you know that's what that was our guidance and we had to do that um, I distinctly remember talking to the helicopter pilots and telling them that we do need to do a ground BDA um, they sound a little bit hesitant saying hey you know where we conducted the airstrikes a little bit suspicious, suspicious area we don't recommend going on foot or there um, but it was guidance from higher I think this was a brigade level guidance that every time we did we we need to and uh, because the helicopter pilots worked at a different they weren't they're supporting us. They weren't actually our our entity. Um, they um, and they've been there longer, so they know the area. I, I remember saying, "Hey, okay, we still need to go over there and and re recover what's left of 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 them and cordon off that area." And kind of got with the PL, the platoon leader, who was um, my ranger buddy, actually. Meaning we both went to ranger school at the same time, and we were really close. And just so happens that we were assigned to the same company. Um, and I loved going out on patrols with him on, on a daily basis, and I loved working with him. Me and him got, got along very well. Um, and I was out there with my snipers, like the sniper guys that were with us, great guys. Um, uh, kind of, you know, like I said, came up with a quick plan, uh, a quick route. I, I got some assistance from the helicopter pilots and where we needed to go and uh, where we needed to turn and where exactly the bodies were. And, they, and so we... we, we we set on foot and, and we were on the way. Um, the lead man was, I remember, Specialist Hadley has a counter ID equipment. Uh, we call it the Mine Hound. Uh, it's a metal detector. It just detects any kind of signature of, of metal, wires, uh, whatever, and he's he was specifically trained on that uh, to find IEDs. Uh, we always traveled in a straight single file line. Our, um, our, our company TTPs, we, we practice to the T and every company's TTPs are different in their tactics, techniques, procedures. Um, and we always maintain a single file line. We always marked off what's called the path of life, meaning 
it hasn't been cleared from the mine hound and so don't step outside of the path of life and even the mine hound doesn't catch 100% of the IDs like the one that I stepped on didn't catch 100% it well, didn't catch that um, specific ID but um, so he was first the squad leader behind him was Sergeant Mack was the second and I was the third behind him uh, telling them pretty much where to go where to turn and where the body was and uh, uh, like I said you know I, I never stepped out of the path of, of life and we also actually led with a dozer vehicle we had another squad leader in there in front of Hadley so that would create a path that would push out the dirt and, uh, that we could walk in um, and uh, like I said it was not that far away I think like 600 700 meters and we hit the road um, the squad leader who's in the, the dozer vehicle hit the road and um, Hadley cleared the mound that the dozer vehicle caused which like I said pushes out the sand I think he cleared that mound he stepped on there and then hit the road uh, the body or bodies of w or what was left of it was in a wadi meaning like it's like a little canal where where water flows through but it was there was no water in there and uh, we had identified the first one Sergeant Mack would hit that mound that I was talking about and went toward Hadley and then I was a third guy and, and the last thing I remember in terms of that specifically when I stepped on it I think I stepped on that mound and it, it went off um, and you know f immediately when it happened you get I got I got knocked back um, my right hand was with my rifle, my left hand was out. I'm also a left, left partial amputee. I lost a couple fingers and my radius is fractured and everything. But when I, I got kicked back, initially I didn't realize that my legs were gone. Um, like the initial maybe 15, 20 seconds was my eardrums were blown out. I can't hear anything. I just hear a flat line beep. I hear, and then as, as a couple seconds go by, I can start hearing people yelling, uh, yelling who's hurt or who's hit. And, what's going on and, and I just remember Sergeant, Sergeant Mack uh, and then maybe the other, the other squad leader behind who was Sergeant Donahoe coming up to me and saying sir you're gonna be alright and um, pulling me to uh, pulling me back per se by my my IBA my Kevlar and um, and then s starting to apply first aid um, I remember the first thing, like I said, the first thing I noticed was my hand. It was blood. There was blood everywhere, but it was uh, because it was a really sandy, dusty area. Just big puff of sand still, still around, and you know. Um, so I remember looking at my hand. I was like, "Oh, something really bad ha happened." I hope you know no one else is hurt. And next thing I know, they're applying tourniquets to both of my extremities. From my remember, I think there are two or three on each extremity, and they put two on my arm as well. Um, and then as time kind of kept passing on, I was fully conscious throughout the thing. I was going in and out. I was losing blood at a very alarming rate. Um, and then when I finally realized that something bad happened to my lower extremities, I just remember the blood just rushing down. Uh, I'm in above the knee on the right and below the knee on the left. So I did step on the ID with my right leg, hence I'm a higher amputee on the right. Um, and then the left, I guess, caught the bad, just caught it, I guess. And uh, Anyway, because your femoral artery is on the right side, I remember like, my heart beating to like my blood coming out. It was really weird. It was like, duk, 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 and I can see the blood coming out. And they were tightening the tourniquet and tightening it. And then I remember at a certain point they tightened it and the blood just stopped coming out. And uh, I was getting really cold. And I, I guess I was going in and out at that point because I was losing blood so fast. But when it stopped, I, I realized when it stopped. and. And I kind of knew, hey, I think I'm going to be all right. So I remember getting onto, um, getting onto a stretcher, and then I remember getting you backed out. Uh, I remember talking to my guys, telling them like, don't worry about me, or you know, be fine. You guys are going to be fine. Like you know, it was it was our first like big casualty within our unit too. Um, we had known that there were a couple guys from sister units in the area that were getting hit and and, and whatnot, but within our unit, that was the real first big injury. Um, fortunately, you know, I was the only one hurt severely. I think some guys got knocked back from the blast, but because, like I said, our TTPs and how we were well spaced out, we were able to mitigate or prevent uh, more guys getting severely injured. Jason, uh, let me pause you right there. Yeah, sure. When we yeah, come yeah. back, we'll finish your story. Sounds good. We're back on Veterans Chronicles. We're right in the middle of the obviously very dramatic story <laughs> from Jason Pock, a veteran yeah. of the U.S. Army, veteran of Afghanistan. And Jason, we had just Thankfully, heard you describe how they finally got the, the tourniquets to, to stop the bleeding. Yeah. And 
fortunately you were the only casualty in your unit and and you were right. about to be evacuated when we paused. And so, um, yeah, and, and once those were on, the tourniquets were on, they were tight enough to where it stopped the bleeding. Uh, I was put onto a stretcher, uh, and I remember going into the striker and, and, and going to the closest um, uh, checkpoint where we could have our medevac bird land. Uh, my guys were on it. Like they, in terms of right when it happened, our guys got on the radio immediately and, and called the medevac. Fortunately, medevac was on the ground or I was, I think he was in the air and, and on the ground and landed before we even got to the checkpoint. So uh, I remember getting off the striker, uh, being evac'd off of the striker and the medevac bird already being there. I remember seeing my first sergeant uh, from the company, First Sergeant Cardona, uh, talking to him saying, hey, hey I'm gonna be all right, First Sergeant, make sure everyone else is fine. Um, don't worry about me. And so, and then I remember getting on the bird and, and getting evac'd out and speaking to the, uh, uh, the medics on the on the medevac bird and them asking me where I was from, you know, what day it was, and all that stuff. And I didn't get hit with morphine until I hit the medevac bird, I believe. Um, in terms of pain, I mean, it was painful, but it, I don't think it was. Uh, you know, it was the adrenaline was pumping so fast, you know, that it, it's hard to it, you know, describe it. You know, it's just uh, it just goes. Um, uh, but I do remember getting off the medevac bird, getting put on a stretcher, rolling into the OR in Kandahar, and them ripping off all of my uh, my, my uniform and, and then sticking me with needles, and then that's when I kind of fell under and put me under anesthesia. So, And then uh, I woke up two hours after my first surgery, I think a couple hours. Uh, I remember uh, General Abe Abrams, who was my RC, was the RC South Division Commander uh, at the time, um, gave me, awarded me my Purple Heart at the time, and I woke up to my boss, my battalion fire support officer there, the chaplain, uh, the, the battalion commander, uh, battalion sergeant major, all the guys were there, and um, asked about how the guys were, if they're fine, um, and then, yeah, and that was a ceremony, and then that was kind of off to, from there on, I, I think I did another surgery or two there, and then I got evac'd out too. Uh, Bagram Air Force Base and, and received a couple surgeries there um, and then to launch Stuhl Germany. One thing that, you know, General Abrams had asked me, hey, do you need anything, at, uh, you know, right at, around the time the Purple Heart Ceremony was and I said, sir, I actually want to call my dad, let him know that I'm going to be fine. Uh, I kind of understand as a leader, as a lieutenant, I understood the protocols and how they notify significant others or family members and I uh, fortunately luckily I did call him and I made it happen I told the general I wanted to call my dad and he did and, and we spoke on the phone and you know a couple of weeks down the road when I was at Walter Reed and I was actually in front of my dad talking I remember him telling me that you know good thing that you had called uh, when you did because about a couple hours before that like two or three hours before we had a, a call from the army I guess the personnel, uh, whoever notifies um, the next of kin of, of what had happened, that they had told my dad that I was severely injured in combat. Um, uh, they didn't, they couldn't disclose to what extent my injuries were, nor could they tell me tell my dad if I was going to survive or not, because it was a time when I was in surgery. So, I, I mean, hearing that, I, I knew that was kind of the way they they notified initially, and so I wanted to make sure that with a phone call through General Abrams that he would be notified as soon as possible and, you know, let him know that, you know, I'll be fine, I'll see you guys over at Walter Reed. And so, yeah, and then, like I said, from launch tool and then to, Wal to Walter Reed in Bethesda, it took me, I think, four days to get there. Wow. Um, so from December 12th uh, and the day it happened, I got to Walter Reed on December 16th. So pretty quick. Pretty quick and yeah. Mm -hmm. So. I think the thing most people are going to be so amazed by is mm -hmm. you obviously knew, even if you didn't know the full extent of your injuries when you were, right. so the first thing you wanted to know was how the rest of the guys in your unit were doing. Absolutely. And, um, you know, that's, that's all I cared about. And, you know, a lot of people ask me, you know, how are you coping with your injuries? Are you doing all right? You know, I'm sorry for your loss. Um, but I always say, you know, don't be sorry, you know, and, and if you're going to thank someone, thank those guys out there. You know, I'm happy and I'm glad that I uh, bared the responsibility to be a double amputee. And I'm glad I was the one that stepped on that ID that day. Um, 
you know, like I was telling earlier, telling you earlier, I was the one that was telling these guys where to go. Um, you know, if one of those other guys, one of my guys had stepped on that IED, had suffered the injuries that I had suffered, or even worse, God forbid, lose their life. Me as a leader, me as a lieutenant, the one that's out there calling the shots and telling them where to go, I, I feel like I wouldn't have been able to bear the guilt of that, right? You know, if I came back and knowing that Sergeant Mack or Specialist Hadley or one of those guys where it was going to be an amputee for the rest of their life. You know, me as a leader, I, I you know, so that's why I tell people that I'm, you know, that might sound a little bit arrogant, but, you know, I'm glad that it was me and not them. Um, I would press the reset button and do it all over again if I, if I could. Um, and uh, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's those guys out there. If it wasn't for those guys, I wouldn't be here today sharing my story and being able to articulate what I'm articulating. Um, so, so yeah, it, like I said, it was, it's really all about them. And the hardest thing that I had to do was uh, once I was in, in recovery at Walter Reed, uh, my battalion commander had asked me, for the redeployment ball meeting. When they came back from Afghanistan, they had their fancy, fancy ball at Fort Lewis. They wanted me to be the guest speaker. Um, and at the time, I was, uh, you know, I, I said, absolutely, I would love to see my guy, uh, all the guys again. And but it was probably one of the hardest public speaking engagements that I ever had to do. And it was actually my first official one where I was officially designated as a guest speaker. And so I had been designated as a guest speaker to uh, my battalion ball, redeployment ball, so when they came back. Um, very emotional event. Uh, before I even gone into, had gone into the, the auditorium, I, I ran into a private first class to side that I actually served with overseas. And he actually saw me that day, and he came running over to me and gave me this big bear hug and started crying and, and said, Sir, you know, I'm so glad to see you here uh, to be able to, to share this with us and and speak to us and tell us about your recovery and, and we didn't know whether or not you were gonna um, you were gonna pull through that day and so you know before I even wanted to see everybody else to see that I, I was just like oh man this is gonna be tough and so well, you know I gave gave the speech it was very emotional I, I could remember see all the spouses like crying and tearing up and some of the guys getting a little bit emotional too um, but I pulled through, and then after, you know, and that was kind of a, a highlight of my, my life, right, to be back and give a speech to my guys and give credit to them that the real reason why I'm here is because of them and how well they were prepared and how well they handled themselves overseas. So, so yeah, that was, that's my kind of story on that. How tough, you, mean, you mentioned before that you actually felt like it was a good thing that you, of anybody in the unit, right. stepped on the IED. <coughs> Was it tough mentally coming to grips with the fact that eventually you were going to have to get prosthetics, learn how to use them, and, and kind of learn how to walk again? You know, I, th I think with most, gu most guys that suffer amputations and loss of limbs uh, would agree with me saying that um, you go through a little bit of a dark time initially when it first happens and you're, you're recovering it in the hospital bed because you have a lot of time to think. You have a lot of time to think about, you know, oh man, how is my life going to be different? You know, I was always aware that there were guys that were losing limbs and whatnot, but I didn't, you know, I didn't know what it would actually be like to be them, right? You know, you could only, you could only see those kind of news stories on, on TV and, and, and read articles about them, but to actually be in the shoes of one of them um, or in the prosthetics, uh, it's, uh, you know, I, I, I realized that, hey, you know, this is, this is something that's, you know, you could think of it as a setback, but for me, I, I convinced myself that it was gonna, it was gonna be something that's gonna make me stronger and make me better. Uh, that I was gonna make this, uh, I wasn't gonna make this define me. I was gonna, I wasn't gonna make uh, this uh, prevent me from doing the things that I love doing. Um, you know, I'm, we're really fortunate to be in the day and age that we are, where prosthetics are are very advanced to a point where. Uh, you can do anything, um, whether it be skiing, mono skiing. You know, you could do water sports, jet skiing, cycling. You can do upright cycling, no matter, uh, you know, you, no matter what, with how advanced uh, the technology is nowadays. And it it just gets better and better. And so, um, and another thing that I would have to say is a lot of the guys, uh, my fellow like wounded guys that that came before me. 
would come in and, you know, after the first two weeks, they would come in and talk to me and tell me, hey, sir, everything's going to be fine. You know, you know, the worst was when, was when a guy named Staff Sergeant Travis Mills, who is a quadruple amputee, he came in, he has this energetic, crazy, awesome personality, and he scared my mother with this his crazy arm prosthetic and spinning it 360 and all this stuff. But he came in and told me, hey, sir, like, you're going to be fine, jokingly. You only lost two legs and a couple fingers. I lost all four of my, my limbs, but there's nothing stopping me from what I want to do today. I'm here with my baby girl. I'm here with my wife. I still have my brain, and, and, and I'm doing awesome things. And he came and walked in with these props. And this is before, like like I said, it was only like two or three weeks after I was injured. And to see that is, is a, was a shocker. I was like, oh, man. And then after those type of visits, and he wasn't the only one. There were numerous. Uh, you know, I can name so many that, that came and helped you know, gave me that extra push and guys that are in my shoes and saying that you're going to be fine. It's all downhill from here. It's not, not an uphill climb. Um, so I realized, Hey, it's not that bad. And, and here I am today and I'm working full time and I wear suit, a suit every day to work. And more than half the time people don't even realize that I'm a double amputee and at all. So, um, like I said, it's, it's, it was something in the beginning where you kind of, me being a soccer player in college and everything, I kind of, every time I do watch a soccer game or I see soccer on TV, I kind of look and I say, oh man, I can't really play like I used to, but if I really wanted to, I could, probably could play, but just not as well. But um, aside from that, like I said, there's really no other reason for me to feel sorry for myself. I did what I did. It was my job. It was my duty, nothing more. And um, so that's that. <coughs> You knew I needed that, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Thank you. All right. Uh, last last question before we let you go. Sure. Or last couple questions, anyway. Um, were you planning to have a career in the service initially? Uh, you know what? I really did. Um, I, I wanted to actually go to and be assigned in the Ranger Battalion. I wanted to to transfer over to, uh, I think it's 2nd Ranger Battalion. I think they're located at Fort Lewis. And uh, I wanted to put my packet together while I was in deployment, and that was kind of the career path that I was going to go into because I had went to Ranger School. I already had a tab as a, as a fire supporter. Um, I think at the time when I was going through, there was a higher demand for fire supporters to come into the Ranger, Ranger Battalion. And as a, as a fire support lieutenant with a Ranger tab and a deployment under his belt, I think it would have been a good... Uh, leeway into that so I actually did want to stay in in the military but you know I always tell myself that an opportunity and one door closes and three or four open at the same time and it really did um, so unfortunately I am not able to do what I always wanted to do um, in terms of staying in the military and serving with my guys and being down at that level uh, but I think that the job that I'm in today still plays an active role or a big role in and getting our soldiers um, kind of the best and best equipment that's out there, I think. So if I'm playing a small role, if any at all, I feel like I'm doing something for the greater good in a way. So, Jason, it's an amazing story. Thank uh, you very much absolutely. for sharing it. Anytime. Thank you. Jason Pock, veteran of the U.S. Army, veteran of Afghanistan, joining us today on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. Thanks for listening.